This lecture will help us see how to build a molecular orbital diagram for an octahedral metal complex. In particular, we're going to look at ligands that contain pi donor and pi accepting ligands. All right. Um, if you haven't already, please go back and watch the video on how to build a molecular orbital diagram when we only consider sigma donor ligands. So. We need to go back and remember we have three types of ligands that we classify and how they bond to a metal, sigma donating, pi donating, and pi accepting. Um, and as we go back to remind ourselves of these, we can, we can remind ourselves that often pi donor ligands are things where here we have a pi donor ligand where we have a metal d orbital and some ligand will donate from a P or P symmetry orbital into the metal D orbital. A good sign that you have this would be something like a halide. So here we have a chloride bound to a metal where this lone pair, which is in a P type orbital, can be donated to a metal. And that would be a pi donor ligand. By contrast, we can have a pi accepting ligand. So in a pi accepting ligand, we're going to be donating from a metal d orbital into a pi symmetry orbital on the ligand itself. And the example that we used in this was something like carbon monoxide, where we had a carbon monoxide ligand. And if you remember the way we said this bound to metal, is it's a sigma donor, but it also has a pi star orbital localized on carbon. And this pi star orbital can accept electrons. It's an empty orbital. It's the LUMO of our carbon monoxide. And this can accept electrons from our metal, from a D type orbital. And our sort of way we recognize when a ligand will be able to pi accept is the presence of a multiple bond, double or triple bond, adjacent to the atom bound to the metal, because of that will make the presence of a pi star orbital in our um, ligand. So if we want to build the molecular orbital diagram for this, we're going to consider two types. We're going to consider um, pi donating and pi accepting ligands. And so we'll start off with carbon monoxide, which is a really good pi acceptor. And one of the questions we want to ask ourselves is, if you go back to the spectrochemical series, why is carbon monoxide so high on the spectrochemical series? Why does pi acceptance give rise to a low spin complex, whereas pi donation gives rise to a high spin complex? And the way we're going to make this MO diagram is we can start with the same molecular orbital diagram we've already made for a sigma donor complex. Carbon monoxide is a sigma donor ligand. So we can start there. And all we have to do is add to it the symmetry of our pi accepting ligand, ligands, ligand group orbitals, and add that to our molecular orbital diagram. And so when we go ahead and do this, we can start by building a reducible representation. Uh, we'll go fairly quick through this. Um, you can do this on your own if you want. Um, but the first thing we can say is we can come up with a reducible representation. A couple of things about it. We have uh, identity at E of 12. And that comes about because there are six carbon monoxide ligands. But remember, each carbon monoxide has two orthogonal pi star accepting ligands. And that's how we're getting 12. 6 times 2 to get 12. We can go through and build the, re the rest of the reducible representation. We are in the octahedral point group. So we can go ahead and reduce that. And when we do reduce that, we should end up with our reducible representation of our ligand group orbitals of T1U, T1G, T2U, and T2G. And the immediate thing I hope everyone recognizes when they see this is the formation of this T2G ligand group orbital. If you remember from our molecular orbital diagram of our sigma donor orbitals, the T2G up to this point has been a non-bonding orbital. And immediately we're going to see that is no longer true. So we'll start off and bring back our molecular orbital diagram. So what's shown here? 
is just an MO diagram for the sigma donor only um, ligands. And so we're going to now add in our pi star ligand group orbitals that we just derived the symmetry of. And the question is, where do we put them? Where should, on our axes over on the right, where should our pi star ligand group orbitals go? Should they go down here? Should they go up here? We can think about that for a second and remember what these orbitals are. They are antibonding pi star orbital that came from our carbon monoxide. And the sigma donating also comes from carbon monoxide. And this was our sigma orbit. These are um, our sigma orbitals coming from carbon monoxide. Um, so these pi stars have to be much higher in energy. And so we can go ahead and put them on. And I'm going to throw them way up here at some arbitrary high, higher energy level than our sigma orbitals below. When we look at these, these are the pi star orbitals. And now we can come in and say, here's our ligand group orbitals. What is going to change on our molecular orbital diagram? And when we look at this, what I want us to take note of is we have some orbitals of the same symmetry. We have a T1u orbital, and we have T1Us on our molecular orbital diagram. So those are going to end up forming bonding and antibonding interactions. Um, but most importantly is the set of T2G orbitals. We have so far a non-bonding set of T2Gs. So that set of T2Gs will now form a bonding and antibonding interaction. The T1U and T2Gs, um, or T1Gs, sorry, these have no symmetry metal orbitals, so these are going to stay non-bonding, and we can just bring those over. So when we go to the next slide, we can look at this, and I want us to pay careful attention to the energy level of this T2G set. So currently T2G is right in line with the metal T2G because it's a non-bonding orbital, but as soon as we add that bonding interaction, what happens? This T2G set, if we and make some dots, is now below where we started. We've stabilized the T2G. It's gone down in energy. Up top in this sort of cluster of orbitals, we can see we now have a T2G star um, antibonding orbital. Our T1U star orbital has gone up in energy. We have these non-bonding orbitals. But really, all of this doesn't matter too much for our purposes. The key is this again, our crystal field, which should be shown right here, and this stabilization of the T2G. That stabilization turning T2G from non bonding into a bonding orbital overall is going to give rise to low spin complexes with pi accepting ligands because we've stabilized that T2G. And if we go to put electrons into our system, just like before, we could say those carbon monoxides in this case would donate 12 electrons, and those 12 electrons all come from our um, sigma donating orbitals. That would fill up our box in here with electrons, so all of these are now full from our ligand electrons. So what's left in our crystal field, um, the electrons here come from the metal, and so from our oxidation state and number of D electrons, we could fill this up. And the presence of that pi accepting ligand stabilized the T2G, lowered it, increasing the size of delta octahedral, which gives rise in turn to low spin complexes when we have the chance um, for more than one electron configuration. So those are pi accepting ligands. We can do a similar game for our pi donor ligands. And so we'll reset and again come back to our sigma donor only ligand molecular orbital diagram. And now we're going to consider what happens if we have pi donor ligands. And we can look at this. Um, and in this case, because they're pi donor, that means these orbitals are full of electrons, um, which means these pi donors are actually going to be the homo of our ligands that are coming in. And so the orbital energy on these is going to be much lower than in the pi accepting case. And here we can go ahead and put them on. And so these 
are our pi donor orbitals. Since they're donating electrons, these are all full. And we went ahead and we produced the symmetry labels for all of these. Notice they're the same symmetry labels for the pi accepting because uh, it's the same symmetry type of orbitals. The key is where they are energetically. And we can see being much lower, we're still going to have a bonding and anti-bonding with our T2Gs, just like we did before. But with one key distinction, last time we saw the T2G orbital go down in energy and then formation of a T2G star, which was very high in energy. And in this case, when we go to form that bonding and anti-bonding interaction, we can see the T2G shown here did indeed go down from where it started. But our T2G star is below that EG star orbital. So if we look up here, here's our T2G star and our EG star. And if we think about how to put electrons into this diagram at this point, remember all of these orbitals are full of electrons. So when we go to put electrons into our molecular orbital diagram, all of these orbitals are full of electrons just from our ligands, which means the crystal field at this point is now between this T2G star orbital and our EG star orbital. And remember what we said is pi donor ligands give rise to high spin complexes. And why do they give rise to high spin complexes? Well, the size of delta octahedral is so small because delta octahedral is now between the T2G star and the EG star. So we have a much smaller gap here from the formation of bonding and anti-bonding of the T2G set. Um, and that's what's going to give rise to the smaller delta octahedral. We can now summarize the pi accepting versus pi donor ligands. Um, this figure is attempting to do that. What we see in the middle of this is what does the molecular orbital diagram or really just the crystal field piece look like for a sigma bond only orbital. And what we said was here is our crystal field between T2G and EG star. Um, and we said as a sigma ligand gets become formed stronger bonds with a metal, what happens is the EG star orbital is destabilized, giving rise to a larger delta octahedral. Our pi accepting usually gives low spin complexes, and it gives low spin complexes because we've stabilized the T2G. The stabilization of the T2G orbital give ri gives rise to a strong field or large delta octahedral, and so we end up with low spin. And then on the other side, our pi donor ligands, we can see we have a small delta octahedral, and so these will be high spin in their small delta octahedral again, because we now go in between a T2G star and the EG star orbital. We can put this all together, and when we look at this, we can say with our delta octahedral and our octahedral metal complexes, delta octahedral increases as a ligand becomes a better sigma donor. This is because it stabilizes the EG and destabilizes the EG star, and that's really the key um, for this one. A pi donor ligand stabilized the T2G and destabilized the T2G star. And in this case, the crystal field is from T2G star to EG, so that decreases delta octahedral. Pi accepting ligands have a large delta octahedral since they are going to stabilize the T2G orbitals, giving rise to an increasing delta octahedral complex overall. And remember, the larger the delta O, we get a low spin complex. And these observations really help us to understand the spectrochemical series, which if we put up again, we can look at this and say, low on the spectrochemical series are our pi donor ligands. So we can label those as our pi donors. High on the spectrochemical series, we have our, the two highest ones are our pi acceptor. 
and then in between the intermediates are various ligands of various sigma donor strength and also some weak pi donor ligands. We can see the better the sigma donor, the stronger the delta, the bit larger the delta octahedral, um, and the weaker the sigma donor, the smaller the delta octahedral. So that ends our lecture on molecular orbital diagrams for octahedral metal complexes. We should now have the ability to start to answer some questions about reactivity and property properties of complexes now that we understand the origins of the delta octahedral and the spectrochemical series um, and have these molecular orbital diagrams to work from. Thank you.